everyone, and welcome to another uh, talk and another quarter of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. Uh, we meet here, this is your first time, every Monday at noon in this room. Uh, and I'm going to give you a preview. We ha we've had a couple of changes in schedule, so I'm going to, on my brand new iPad, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> give you a We're preview all of what we have coming <laughs> for the quarter. <laughs> Placement. You're yeah. and it, is, it is on the um, on, on our new and improved deck website. We don't need an iPad. You do not need an iPad to access this. <laughs> um, so next week, uh, Chris von Ruden from the UCSB Department of Anthropology is coming, and he's going to be talking about uh, why men see seek positions of status or leadership. Uh, and then I'll just give you the names and departments of the rest of the quarter, so you have a preview. Uh, the following week, uh, Andrew Delton from UCSB is coming. Uh, on April 18th, Polly Wiesner from the University of Utah. April 25th, Karen Redwine from Whittier College, Department of Psychology. May 2nd, Siobhan uh, Madison from Stanford Anthropology. Uh, May 9th, Peter Nonax from here at UCLA EEB. May 16th, Mary Shank from the University of Missouri, Department of Anthropology. And May 23rd, Charles Perot uh, from here in our own department. So that's what's coming up, and this week uh, I'm happy to uh, introduce Ed Hagen, who is going to be talking about drugs are bad for pathogens, testing an alternative to the hijack model of recreational drug use, and he's here from Washington State University in Vancouver. Welcome. Thank you very much. Is that the invitation? Uh, so let me just uh, give a little bit of the big context of, of my research. Um, so the global burden of disease is defined um, as years lost to disability plus mortality. And many public health researchers think we are in an epi epidemiological transition. Uh, that is, we are slowly winning the battle against infectious disease, and hence the global burden of disease is increasingly shifting towards chronic non-infectious diseases. Um, so here are uh, in high-income countries, here are the top 10 contributors to disease burden. And if you look at this list, you will see that none of these are uh, directly, at least, infectious diseases, although infectious diseases can certainly play a role in some of these. Um, we don't see things like malaria, tuberculosis, and other types of infectious diseases. These are all chronic, non-infectious um, diseases. And um, <clears throat> A lot of these diseases are either mental disorders like depression or things like cancers, um, heart disease, stroke. And those latter diseases, um, these are the, the major risk factors for that disease list. And what you can see here <coughs> is that drug use, uh, particularly tobacco use, but also alcohol use and illicit drug use, are in the top 10 contributors as risk factors uh, for those chronic non infectious diseases. And so addressing these kinds of global health problems will involve addressing uh, and understanding uh, drug use. Um, and it's a pretty major problem, as we all know. Uh, mortality due to tobacco use globally is about 12% of all mortality can be uh, directly tied to tobacco use. And in developed countries like the US and Europe, it's an astounding 20%. Um, now the question is, why are we winning the battle against infectious disease, but not these chronic diseases? And part of the answer, at least I think, is that for infectious disease, we have the correct conceptual model, which is, of course, the germ theory of disease. Um, and once you have that model, then the solution to these things becomes pretty easy. You just need to either avoid them with sanitation or kill them with things like antibiotics or teaching your immune system to respond more effectively to them. And uh, these work extremely well and have been responsible for a dramatic decline in the burden imposed by infectious disease especially in wealthy countries that can afford uh, these kinds of remedies. Uh, what I'm going to argue, however, is that the, uh, the major contributors to chronic and non-infectious disease burden, like mental illnesses and drug use, um, that we might not have the, conceptual, the correct conceptual models. And that's why it's been so difficult to address these. And today, what I'm going to focus on is drug use. So there are two, or at least two, big scientific paradigms for investigating the effects of recreational plant drugs. And what I'm going to argue is that these two paradigms are in conflict. One is an evolutionary biology paradigm, an ultimate level explanation of drug origins. 
And the second is a proximate level framework for neurobiology um, that uh, attempts to explain drug seeking and use. So, um, and this latter model is often referred to as the reward model of drug use. And probably most of you have encountered this model at some point. Um, and it involves some, a region in the brain, circled in red there, called the mesolimbic dopamine system. And the basic idea is very simple, that drugs of abuse like opiates and nicotine uh, bind to receptors um, in particular in an area called the VTA, and receptors in particular are dopamine neurons. These dopamine neurons project into the nucleus accumbens and release dopamine. And that dopamine um, was initially thought to be a pleasure chemical, that it was directly responsible for hedonic effect of drugs. Uh, I would say now virtually all neurobiologists believe that dopamine is not directly responsible for hedonic feelings, but instead plays some other role in reward processing. For example, it might be a reward prediction error. But regardless, this effect of drugs on this particular region of the brain has the effect of interfering with the reward system to the effect of reinforcing drug seeking and use. Uh, now let me contrast that model with what I had termed uh, the punishment model of drug origins. This is an ultimate level, and uh, not developed by me, but this, this model um, uh, developed by botanists primarily. And um, it's about the origins of these drugs. Where do they come from? And of course many of them, not all of them, but many of them are plant drugs. And of course plants are producing sugar, uh, carbohydrates for their own growth and development <coughs> in photosynthesis. Uh, and that sugar is a very valuable resource for a wide variety of herbivores, also known as heterotrophs. And although we might think of deer and caterpillars as the prototypical herbivores, it also includes uh, nematodes, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and so forth that feed on that sugar. Um, plants, of course, don't take that sitting down. Metaphorically speaking, they have co-evolved a number of defensive mechanisms uh, against herbivores, and those include numerous toxins, uh, especially neurotoxins. And these neurotoxins disrupt neural signaling in the herbivores. And if we look at uh, drugs, most of them are plant neurotoxins. So we have tobacco and paturi uh, producing nicotine. Um, that interferes with the acetylcholine signaling system, in particular nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors. Betel nut, widely chewed in the South Pacific, uh, produces aricoline and also interferes with the acetylcholine signaling system that on this muscarinic uh, receptor. Coca, cocaine, uh, interferes with the norepinephrine, the epinephrine, that's an adrenergic receptor system, and so on down the line. All these very uh, commonly used plant drugs um, are affected because they are interfering with some neurotransmitter system. So the paradox a drug reward uh, that my colleagues and I have been writing about uh, recently is that these drugs, as you can see in caffeine, only exist because they deterred herbivores, not rewarded them. And herbivores, in turn, have evolved to avoid, expel, and neutralize these toxins. And so reactions to toxins should generally be aversive and not rewarding. Um, and so we see the reward model of drug use at the neurobiological level um, in conceptual conflict with the punishment model at the ultimate level. Why would very potent uh, neurotoxins, why would we become, seek them out and become addicted to them? So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is a particular one, nicotine, basically because there's tons of research on it. And it also has one of the most negative health consequences of all the drugs. So uh, how does nicotine work? <coughs> Uh, well, there's an endogenous neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Probably everybody knows about this. It binds to receptors, acetylcholine receptors. Um, there's two major types, nicotinic and muscarinic. And uh, nicotine is a plant neurotoxin that essentially mimics acetylcholine and binds to acetylcholine receptors. And acetylcholine receptors play critical roles in a number of functions, in particular um, at the neuromuscular junction. So the brain talks to your muscles. Uh, via the signaling pathway, and nicotine, by binding to that acetylcholine receptor, interferes with your ability of your brain to control your muscles, and that would include your heart muscle, your diaphragm, and so forth. So you can see why it'd be such a, a, an potent toxin. And one thing I think that's 
not very well known is that nicotine is extraordinarily toxic to humans. So on the top row there, I have the lethal dose for hydrogen cyanide. This is widely used to execute prisoners in gas chambers. It was the active ingredient in Zyklon B. 50 milligrams of that stuff will kill an adult. Uh, and that's about the same toxicity as nicotine. 30 to 60 milligrams of nicotine will also kill an adult. Um, now, interestingly, the toxicity of nicotine plays almost no role in theory of drug use. So we, we think, oh yeah, cigarettes are dangerous. Of course, we know that. But the danger from cigarettes, uh, the chronic diseases like cancer and heart disease, do not come from nicotine directly. They come from the other products in the tobacco smoke. And so far as anyone has been able to determine, nicotine itself uh, is quote unquote safe. So the, the acute toxicity <coughs> that we're seeing here is not the same, uh, is not responsible for the chronic health problems caused by smoking. And so as a consequence, it plays almost no role in theories of, of uh, mainstream theories of drug use. Um, and you can see uh, the recreational dose is actually kind of high compared to that lethal dose. So if you smoke a cigarette, you absorb roughly <coughs> a milligram of nicotine. Uh, if you chew tobacco, you might absorb up to four to five milligrams. Um, at which point you might become acutely ill. So you're about somewhere between a factor of 10 and 20 below a lethal dose when you just uh, regular use of tobacco, as most people use it. Um, now one thing that I've been thinking about is why are there no nicotine overdoses? There's about a billion tobacco users. They're smoking 15 billion cigarettes every day. Uh, and there's essentially no acute mortality from tobacco use. And it's pretty <laughs> remarkable. How could you have that many users and that much nicotine and I have at least some, you know, tenth of a percent or hundredth of a percent of, of overdoses. Uh, it doesn't, it just seems extraordinary that our systems are so effective that they prevent this extremely deadly neurotoxin from causing any real serious harm. Um, now, part of the answer might seem to be, or it might be, that nicotine activates many toxin defense mechanisms. It tastes bitter. So it activates your bitter taste receptors. Uh, bitter taste receptors are expressed in your GI tract. It activates those. Um, we have something called xenobiotic sensing nuclear receptors. These are inside cells, and they um, essentially detect xenobiotics means foreign substance like plant toxins. And they detect these plant toxins and then upregulate uh, xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes. Um, nicotine does that. Nicotine is very effectively metabolized by these enzymes. And nicotine also activates aversion circuitry in the central nervous system. So a whole host of defense mechanisms are activated by nicotine. And um, that also makes the, the, the use of nicotine all the more puzzling or paradoxical, I think. How is it? It seems like the use of tobacco just represents an extraordinary breakdown, potentially, of, of toxin defense mechanisms, um, or at least tobacco addiction does. Um, and interestingly, those aversion circuits that are triggered by nicotine are found in the same part of the brain exactly as the reward circuits that are also putatively, or that are actually are also uh, triggered by nicotine. So the same circuits that are involved in the rewarding properties of circotine, uh, nicotine, the neurobiological properties, are exactly the same circuits that are involved in the aversive system. And so this, I think, raises the possibility that the circuitry is not just rewarding people, but it's regulating intake of nicotine. So instead of eliminating, uh, so here's approximate level alternative hypothesis to the reward model. Nicotine is not simply rewarding, but rather it's being regulated by a circuit that's balancing somehow some benefit against some cost and very tightly controlling. It's not, it should, if it was a pure toxin, it should just push it to zero. It's not doing that but it's also not letting it rise above a very critical level at which point people will become acutely ill or die. So there's some very, very tight regulation of nicotine potential, this is a hypothesis, going on here. And also, the same might be true of other psychoactive drugs. Now, why would there be such a regulatory mechanism if indeed there is? And we're going to look at, I'm going to explore one hypothesis, one ultimate level hypothesis for why such a regulatory mechanism might have evolved. Um, and that is that we have an evolved propensity to use these neurotoxins for the same purposes for which they were designed, and quote unquote, and by design I mean for the reasons that they evolved by natural selection. And that is this, that 
animal and plant pathogens are basically the same. That we are attacked by the same categories in broad strokes. Uh, viruses, bacteria, nematodes, and arthropods. Um, so is it possible? Animals, of course, have evolved to exploit plant tissues for macronutrients. Have we also evolved to take uh, advantage of 400 million years of pharmacological R&D by plants? And so uh, we've been referring to this as a, the pharmacophagy hypothesis, um, that psychoactive compounds are attractive because they manifestly interfere with neural signaling. If you take a substance and it gives you a buzz, that's a very uh, reliable cue <coughs> that that substance is interfering with neural signaling. Um, if it's interfering with your neural signaling, it will very likely interfere with the neural signaling of some pathogen that also has a nervous system. Uh, for example, helmets, arthropods, things like that. Um, and so I contrast the, the reward model here in that little diagram on the, on the right. The reward model views nicotine, this deadly insecticide, as basically a big ice cream sundae. It's a big uh, signal or false signal of some reward, and that's why you use it according to the standard model. What we're proposing instead is that that uh, deadly substance is, in a sense, a form of medication. And this sort of self-medication slash pharmacophagy hypothesis has two sub-hypotheses. Um, and these parallel the uh, pattern that we see actually in tobacco plants. So tobacco plants evolve nicotine to protect themselves from uh, herbivores. And um, if you raise a tobacco plant in a perfectly sterile environment, um, it will still produce nicotine. And botanists refer to this as a constitutive defense. There's a base level of nicotine to deter any future attack. But nicotine is very expensive to produce. It's, a, it's an alkaloid. It's uh, very rich in nitrogen. That's a constrained nutrient for plants. So plants don't want to produce more nicotine than they have to, the tobacco plants, speaking metaphorically here. Um, so they produce a base level. Uh, however, if they get attacked by, say, a caterpillar or something that starts munching on their leaves, they very rapidly upregulate nicotine production, pump that stuff into the leaves, uh, and that's called an inducible defense. Once the attack ceases, that nicotine regulation drops back down again. So we're referring to that, what botanists refer to as a constitutive defense, that baseline of nicotine level, as chemoprophylaxis. So this idea would be, this hypothesis would be that recreational drug use by people that are not infected with anything uh, serves as a form of prophylaxis. It pro deters future infections by pathogens with nervous systems. Um, and then chemotherapy would be, again, analogous to the tobacco plant, the inducible defense, upregulating uh, nicotine production. Recreational drug might then increase uh, when people are infected in order to treat that infection and then decrease when the infection fades. So these are two sub-hypotheses that we're I'm going to talk about today and some data that I've collected on this. And the pathogen that I'll be looking at is helminths. About 2 billion people are estimated to be infected with um, these guys. They have, as we all probably know, numerous negative health consequences like nutrition, impaired growth and development, iron deficiency anemia, decreased physical fitness and work capacity, impaired cognitive function. And just to give a sense of how bad these things are, um, they're roughly comparable to either tuberculosis or malaria in terms of uh, the metric that most public health officials use, global burden of disease. Um, this is a, a daily unit. So that just gives a sense of, of what these things are, how bad they are, and why there might be a selection pressure to evolve mechanisms to treat or prevent infection with helmets or treat them once you have them. So what about nicotine? Turns out nicotine is pretty effective against helminths. Um, many commercial anthelmintics as an anti-worm medicine, such as levamisole, attack the exact same neurotransmitter system as nicotine, these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. This time, of course, in the worm, not in the host. Nicotine sulfate, uh, up until the 50s, was widely used to deworm livestock until uh, the development of more effective uh, commercial anthelmintics. Uh, aqueous tobacco extracts are still used today in the developing world to deworm livestock by farmers that can't uh, afford the commercial stuff. And um, tobacco use is widely reported as an anthelmintic in the ethno-medical uh, literature. So, um, to study this, um, I called my colleagues and I have initiated a, a series of studies in the uh, Central African Republic with the ACA. These are uh, pygmy foragers. 
And the rationale for this study site is that they have high levels of intestinal parasites, and they smoke a lot of tobacco, and finally they have almost no access to commercial antimentics. And so these folks might be motivated to either consciously or unconsciously consume locally available plant substances like tobacco as a way of medicating themselves against helmets. So what I'm going to do first is describe a 2008 pilot study that uh, maybe one or two of you saw at HBEST a couple years ago. And I'm going to spend a little time on this because it will motivate the, way, the reason the way we structured uh, a 2010 study that, that I'll then talk about. So this is a small study um, exactly in that population, 19 males, 20 females, um, with this kind of rough age distribution here. And our predictor variables were self-reported smoker uh, status um, to index chronic nicotine exposure, and then salivary coating. So when you smoke a cigarette, you absorb nicotine. Your body eliminates nicotine pretty rapidly. It has a half-life of about two hours. Um, and it metabolizes it to coatine, which has a much longer half-life of about 18 hours. And so the standard way of measuring nicotine exposure is to instead assay salivary coatine. And it's a very inexpensive and reliable and accurate way of assessing recent nicotine exposure. Uh, just to give you a sense of the relationship between the number of cigarettes smoked and coatine, we're going to be talking about coatine concentrations quite a bit, so let me just give you a feel for this. Uh, the unit of concentration is nanograms per milliliter, so from zero to 1,000 here. And um, these are four populations, studies of salivary coatine versus cigarette use in these populations. And what you can see is there's basically a linear relationship between cigarette smoke and uh, coatine levels. It's about 12, each cigarette contributes on average about 12 nanograms per milliliter of uh, coatine in saliva. And you can see it's a pretty linear relationship, except maybe up to about one pack, where it looks like in several of these uh, curves, it then levels off and maybe saturates. But at least between zero and 20 cigarettes, you've got a pretty linear relationship between your coating concentration and the number of cigarettes that you smoked in the previous 24 hours. Okay, what's our outcome variable? This is worm burden, uh, assessed with stool samples. Um, humans are infected primarily with three species of worms, hookworm, um, ascaris, and whipworm. And um, what we did is just took stool samples and then measured uh, eggs per gram on kind of a semi-quantitative zero to three point scale for each of these species. And then we just added those all up for a total worm burden score. So predictions from the chemoprophylaxis hypothesis uh, that among the uninfected, so this is, remember you're doing, according to this hypothesis, you're smoking to prevent infection. So we would look at the uninfected and then calculate whether smokers are overrepresented in that group. And then the chemotherapy hypothesis, the predictions are that uh, for people who are infected, that self-reported smokers will have lower helminth loads and um, that salivary coatening will be inversely correlated with helmet load. So the more you smoke, uh, the lower worm burden you have. So just to give a quick sense, uh, here's the number of males and females in the small sample that self-reported smoking. And what you can see here is that essentially all males, with one exception, said they were smokers, and most females said they were not smokers, with just a few exceptions. Uh, this is our distribution of coatening in that uh, sample, and it's a very <coughs> typical distribution. Here's your non-smokers here, and then here's all your smokers here. And it goes from that scale of about 0 to 1,000 to here we have about 100 to 800 nanograms per milliliter, very, very typical distribution of coating in this population for the smokers. That was our cutoff there, 80 nan nanograms per milliliter, defining recent smokers. Now when we look, basically we're drug testing people, uh, does the self-reported smoker line up with the coatening levels? Um, what you can see is that if you say you're not a smoker, um, then it does line up very well. Your coatening levels are quite low. If you say you are a smoker, uh, most of those folks do have pretty high coatening levels with five exceptions. Four of those five exceptions are women. So the women who said they were smoking, four of the five women who said they were smoking, in fact, showed no evidence of recent smoking. And that's going to be important for how we structure the study here. So that's just our worm burden score. You can just kind of see that their population is pretty heavily infected with appreciable levels of all these three intestinal worms. 
especially what's, what's the x-axis um that's just a history oh that's just a, your helmet load score so remember we had we took the semi-quantitative thing and added it so that's just so zero would be uninfected and 10 would be the maximum or nine would be the maximum level of infection okay uh in both the studies i'm going to report we don't there's so few uninfected individuals that we can't really do a clean statistical test of whether smokers are overrepresented because there aren't very many of them. In this new study, I think we might have enough, and I'll just confess I didn't have time to run that stat. So, uh, we have about 20 uninfected smokers in this, in this new study that I'll talk about, and that might be enough to run the stats, but it wasn't in this part of the study. Okay, so putting, kind of putting the chemoprophylaxis hypothesis aside, what I'm going to focus now almost exclusively on is the chemotherapy hypothesis. And this is that self-reported smokers, prediction one, will have lower helmet load. Now a challenge, a statistical challenge we have in this pilot study is that there's essentially no variation in male self-reported smoker status. So we can't look at male smokers versus non-smokers. We can only test this one in women because there was only enough uh, variation to test it. And yes, at least in a small sample, uh, smokers, self-reported smokers, did have lower helmet load than non-smokers. So what about the inverse correlation of salivary coatening with helmet load? <coughs> so here's the raw, all of our data. Here's salivary coatening versus worm score, and you can see there's a curvilinear relationship going positive from low levels up to about 100 or 200 nanograms per milliliter and then decreasing. Um, the problem here is that all of those non-smokers are, most of them are women, whereas almost all of the guys in the red box are men. So we have low levels of coatening being com almost completely confounded with sex. And so is that difference we see between those two regions due to differences in the levels of smoking or is it due to sex differences? And it's essentially impossible for us to unconfound that with this data set. So we just restricted ourselves to that red box. If we restrict ourselves only to the red box, which are recent male smokers, with one exception, we get this relationship, a pretty strong negative correlation for males between salivary coatening and worm burden score. Question, Carl. Are you going to compare this to um, some kind of individual difference perspective? So there's various perspectives on drug use and alcohol are really about signaling something, some right. quality. Sure. Right? And maybe, maybe by, by showing um, that you can take it, you can, right. you can smoke this stuff, that you're really... Right. And so, Costly signaling. And that's, and then so yeah, so you're basically raising a, a particular example of a more general problem, which is correlation versus causation. Like, causation could be in the opposite direction. I think that's what you're kind of getting at here. These guys have a low worm burden score, so they can show off by smoking more. Yes, that is, these data would be consistent with something, an alternative hypothesis like that, or any other, because it's, it's a correlational analysis. We can't determine the direction of causation, or there could be some third variable. I'll be getting into that in a little bit more detail, but you're absolutely right. Um, so we get the negative correlation, but yes, it's a correlation. So here's the limitations. Correlation does not equal causation. Maybe healthier people smoke more. Maybe they just feel better, and so they can smoke more. They're not even trying to signal anything. It's just uh, if you feel crappy, maybe you don't feel like smoking. Um, some variable might confound smoking and helmet load. Uh, maybe the richer ACA are healthier and also buy more cigarettes. Uh, maybe smoking decreases helmet egg expulsion independent of infection levels. Somehow there could be some interaction between nicotine and, and egg expulsion. Um, another limitation is we only have one saliva and one stool sample per person. So we're trying to get it sort of generalized patterns of smoking with a single saliva sample, not too accurate. And also, looking at helmet infections with only one stool sample, there's a lot of noise there. And um, it's very common that helmets don't release eggs all the time, so you could have a zero worm score and yet be pretty heavily infected with worms. Um, and then finally, we have, as you can see, a very small sample size. Uh, so we could only test self-reported smokers versus helmets in women, and we could only test salivary coating versus helmets in male recent smokers. So let me turn now to our 2010 study. And uh, here are some of the improvements over that 2008 study. Uh, we've increased the sample size by about a factor of 10. 
And now we have the original, the original population was this village where you see the number one in a single trail. So the Aka live on these trails that radiate out from villages and they bring forest products into the village along those trails and then take for, uh, village products like primarily uh, agricultural goods and move them out along those trails. And there's a, a number of trails radiating into this village. We just sampled one population of Aka on one trail in that one region. Um, in our new study, we sample all of the trails in all three of these regions. So it's a much broader uh, and more, probably more representative study than the original study. Um, we now have up to six saliva and stool samples per person rather than just one. Um, and we measured a number of controls, and I think the primary way that you guys could help me out is what is going to confound smoking and worms. <laughs> The more compounds we can think of, the better controls we have. But I've got the compounds that we, potential compounds that we thought of. And then finally, um, we augment the observational design of that original study with a new experimental design, which I'll describe in a bit. So where are the controls that we came up with? Uh, material wealth. Um, so maybe richer Aka are um, healthier and or have more money to buy cigarettes or something like this, and they're healthier also. So the way we measure material wealth is just asking um, each participant, oh, and let me make one more point before I go on. What I'm going to talk about, we pretty much just limited our uh, study to men this time. Because as you saw, there was a dramatic sex difference in smoking patterns between men and women. And um, so to, to increase our power to detect effects, we wanted a highly homogeneous sample on all the variables except the variables of interest. So we did collect data from about 100 women, which we haven't analyzed yet. But the primary focus on the study is, is male smoking, because those are the guys that do it by far the most smoking. So we asked each guy um, if they owned one of these things, a radio, a flashlight, a watch, um, and how many sets of clothes they owned. That was our measure of material wealth. Our measure of culturation, again, maybe folks that are more culturated have more access to tobacco, and um, also are healthier because they have access to other things in the village. So we asked if they preferred the forest or the village, um, their schooling, both elementary school and kind of a high school measure, and their church attendance. That's our measure of acculturation. Uh, we had regions now as controls, those three regions that I showed you. We had age, which we had in the original study. Um, we asked about traditional healer status. Uh, traditional healers uh, might have special access to medicines. They have a lot of knowledge of local plant medicines. And so it might be that some effect of healers are driving all this. Um, and we did the same for camp leaders for the same reason, that there might be something about those categories of individuals that are special and are confounding smoking and worms. Oh, uh, good question. So these guys live on these trails, and um, they live in little camps of uh, half a dozen people or so, and each camp has a nominal leader. Now this population is renowned for its egalitarianism. There are very, very few status uh, differences. Um, and basically, the two status differences that exist are whether or not you're a healer and whether you're the leader of the camp. But the leaders of the camp, the ethnography doesn't show that they have any special prerogatives or anything like that. Typically, they're the oldest guy in the, in the camp, and the camp is named after them. However, some studies have shown that these guys are called combetis. Uh, do have better dental health than the other guys. So it does suggest there is some differential access to something, probably meat, because uh, dental caries, and a dental caries is negatively correlated with meat consumption. So they might have preferential access to, to meat. And the churches? So there are local churches, so that's getting at acculturation, and the, just as everywhere the missionaries and the um, churches are trying to attract the local folks into the church. And um, so that's a measure of, if you did go to church, that you're more acculturated, maybe having more access to Western medicines or something like this. Is there also indigenous religious practice? Indigenous? Religious practice? Well, there's a, a whole variety of churches that are um, various combinations of pure Western church to very Africanized Christian, forms of Christianity, things like that. But the Aka themselves, although they, of course, have a very rich religious tradition. It's not formalized in a church or anything like that. So this is very much well, at these village could churches. Could you, could you measure participation in that? Because church attendance could also reflect all sorts of other psychological characteristics other than acculturation. Yes, it could. Um, you're wondering, could we measure 
indigenous religiosity as opposed to going to church. You can deal with that by seeing if those co-vary with it. Yeah, that would be a good way. We, should, we do need to see if these uh, measures are uh, what the factor structure is, basically. That's a good point. And uh, yeah, your point was well taken. How good are, we have questions about our, that ourselves, how good a measure of acculturation are these? Um, and so we do need to kind of do some work to show that these, in fact, are good measures of what we set out to measure. We'll find out. We have, we have the data. I haven't run it. But that's a good question. But that's what we kind of predicted. We didn't know if these would just be independent factors or or how they might be correlated. So but if, there's a, if there's a rising ritual or a before meal ritual <clears throat> that people are supposed to follow, you could ask whether they do that. <coughs> Trying to think how that would work in this population. Um, basically, the, the big religious rituals are these big dances, and basically everybody goes to them. Um, so I'm not sh sure, and they're very attractive. Everybody loves to go to them. So I mean, there's probably there's variation in everything, but I'm not sure if that would really get at what we're trying to get at here or not. But it might. It's, a, it's an interesting suggestion. OK, so this is just um, looking at the chemotherapy hypothesis. This is essentially trying to replicate what we saw in 2008. So we interview everybody on entrance into the study, and then we take three saliva samples and three stool samples per subject over a period of about six days to a week or so. And here are those data. So then, salivary coating on the X and wind burden on the Y. Um, now, in the previous study, we saw this exact same curvilinear relationship. However, this end was all women, almost, almost all women, whereas this was all men. However, the data you're looking at here are all men. Um, so we can no longer use the excuse that we're, we're getting this increase due to some confound with sex. Um, that increase is something that we did not predict, and that is an unexpected feature of our data, that worm burden is positively correlated with coating concentration up to something about 150 nanograms per milliliter. And we don't have any great ideas about what's going on there, if anything. However, you can see uh, for the sort of moderate to heavy smokers, there's a pretty obvious negative relationship, which is the one we did predict. They're, at their only nicotine use is through smoking? Is that... um, we also have, so we, almost all of it's smoking. There's some snuff use, very little. And we did ask about chewing, snuff, uh, tobacco smoking, and um, it's almost all smoking. Question. And we, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the last time the worm burden score was 0 to 9 in this place. Yeah, this time. So we had a new guy, same institute, the Institute Pasteur and Bambi, that did these analyses for us. And um, the first guy used a kind of a 0 to 3, and this guy used a 0 to 10 scale. Multiplied by 6, or 6. Um, no, what were, yeah, good, another good question. So we have that 0 to 10 scale, and then added across uh, three parasites and three different ways of measuring each parasite. So a score, the potential top score would be all three measures came out 10 for all three parasites, which would give you a score of 90 maximum. Does that make sense? Yeah. And what we're seeing here is another thing that should come out. Each one of these is not an individual person, but instead an individual coating measurement. So there's up to six. Well, on this chart, there's only up to three, because you'll see why. These are the first three sets of measurements. The second three are going to be quite different. You'll see why in a minute. Um, OK. So here are some linear models of those data. Uh, these are mixed effects models. So we use individual as a grouping factor and also region as a grouping factor. And uh, the top model is where we include the entire range of data from 0 to whatever the maximum coating level is. And what you can see is that there's a not quite significant negative relationship between cotinine and uh, worm burden score, and there's a significant interaction between cotinine and age, which I'll show you in a second. Um, if we eliminate, now this is supposed to be about, so this is including all the data. But this, is, this hypothesis is supposed to apply only to uh, people who are infected already and are treating themselves. If we eliminate the worm equals zero guys, then that does become significant. That's about 0.03. Coefficients are all about the same. Um, but I just, to be most conservative, I would include all the data here. Now, if we just restrict ourselves to this decreasing region, 
Uh, we get pretty much the same model, but now it's statistically significant. Uh, again, we don't have any principal reason except that maybe our hypothesis only applies to regular smokers. It doesn't apply to these guys at the low end, a lot of which, and a lot of those data are simply uh, what's called environmental tobacco smoke exposure. You can get about a 2, 15 nanograms per milliliter concentration of codeine simply from passive absorption of tobacco smoke. And these guys live in little huts where everybody's smoking all the time. So at the really low end here, we might have non-smokers that have some codeine just from passive exposure to other people's smoke. So it might be that our hypothesis only applies to the regular smokers, which would be this part of the data. So do you have self-reports about whether or not they're smokers? Yes, we do. And um, as you saw in the first study, all the men said they were. Now in the second study, we did the same thing. Um, and again, all of the men pretty much said they were, with just a few exceptions. But I'll be honest, I haven't fully crunched all those data yet. Um, but I don't expect it to be too different than what we saw here. So I'm not. What we have is a little more fine grained, and I haven't looked at this variable yet. But did you smoke a cigarette today? Yeah. And did you smoke a cigarette yesterday? So you and might be able to actually. We might be able to figure out, test idea. that idea. Yes, yeah. we yeah. do. Yes, we do have the data. I just haven't done. Ron, um, two questions. First, in the in the table you had before, what's the column value? Is, are those betas? Are those standard? Okay, values? so these are. This is how R reports. So this is just a cut and paste out of R for those who uh, know R. And um, for your continuous variables, these are unstandardized coefficients. Unstandardized. Okay. Um, so the the suggestion I have, you go to the graph. It, it seems to me that it's not obvious. Your hypothesis, when you first put it up, seemed to me to be. You could tell two stories, right? People take a lot, smoke a lot, and that kills the helmets, and they have less helmets. The other story you could tell is people who feel lousy um, somehow know that uh, smoking will help them, and um, so they smoke more because um, because they're medicating themselves. And I mean that could, if, if you imagine that that on the left-hand edge, that's where people aren't getting enough tobacco to do the job to really to to get their helmet burdens down, so they're they're trying to smoke more, maybe they're too poor or whatever, and um, I don't know. And that's one story you could tell, it seems to me. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's kind of the story we've been thinking about. And one way we might be able to test that is we have these three regions. So we have the guys that are close to the village and then the guys yeah. that are more remote. And if we saw more of this kind of stuff, and if, these, if the remote regions are overrepresented in this area, right. that might support that. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> Tom. I wonder also, is it possible the, the initial increase is some kind of flushing effect of getting Tobacco's causing a bunch of eggs to be released. Well, we're just we're stepping in, but we assume they've been smoking the whole time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if, if it's just a little, if the person just has a little bit, then it's it's ramping up the the, the helmet, some kind of emergency response or something. Whereas if they've been doing it for a while, then it's already done the effect of most of I don't think I I think we're looking in roughly a steady state. Right. I don't know that for sure, obviously, because we don't. And I might be able to test what you're saying because, as you'll see, we have six more samples across a longer time period. So we can look at the earlier samples versus the later samples and look for something like that. So that's a good idea. Yeah? What's the age initiation? Age of? Initiation. To smoking? Uh, we do have some of those. We have interviews with mothers about when their kids start smoking. And my graduate student has those data, but I don't know what they are. But we, it's, uh, the boys gradually, as they turn into the teen years, start smoking, but exactly what this, and we don't have very, I need to say, we don't have very accurate ages in this population. They don't track their age. And so all the ages that we do have are our farmer assistants or our to assistants estimating ages based on their personal knowledge of that person or that population that they've worked with. So we have crude it, measures of age. Doesn't that give you a, a study option to go back at you know, three-year intervals and see if you can predict Initiation by worm load and see if initiation guts worm load. Uh, that's a good, very good idea. And you'll see we can do something maybe a little better than that, but that's a very good idea. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Um, I'll put that on my NHH grade. <laughs> good idea. Uh, okay, so oh, Carlos. What happens when you um, log transform your data? Does it look the same? Um, I haven't done any transforms of these data. So this is all we're only plug it into the model and see what we get. Um, what we see here is that we have very a lot of heteroscedasticity. Uh, and the models that I'm using, you can model that. And um, I haven't done that. I actually tried to do it in the model and it didn't converge. It's a so I have to figure out why it's not converging. But basically we can we can deal with a lot of this 
unequal variation across the plot in the models that we use. Uh, here's the interaction fact. So these are the low cotinine guys, these are the high cotinine guys, this is the interaction with age, this is the worm score. And what you can see is that cotinine is a very strong negative correlation with worm load for the young and much weaker one for the old. So that's the na nature of that interaction. Uh, not sure why that's going on either, but maybe that's another thing we can discuss why there's that big difference in, in age, the effects of cotinine on worm by age. Okay, let me get now to the experimental study. So if chemotherapy hypothesis infects <coughs> with helmets should increase smoking, uh, and then by the same token, elimination of helmets should decrease smoking. Well, I didn't think I could get IRB to let me infect people with worms, <laughs> but I figured I could get them to let me treat people for worms, which indeed they did, um, after quite a bit of hassle. But. Um, and so the study design was take those same three samples that I talked about over the first week, um, and then at that point, after taking that third sample, randomize our population, our sample, excuse me, into uh, abendazole treatment and placebo control groups. And that was done double blind, so we had pills that were identical appearance. One's a placebo, one's abendazole. Abendazole, for those of you who don't know, is a very effective uh, anti-worm medicine. You just have to take a single 400 milligram dose. That's it. There's almost no side effects. It's extraordinarily safe. It's, it's very cheap and very effective. So it's really ideal for this kind of study. Um, then we waited roughly one or two weeks. Are durable? Um, once you get rid of them, then they can come back as soon as you're exposed again. So it just gets rid of what you got. It doesn't protect you against future um, infections. Um, so we waited about a week, roughly, um, sometimes two. And then we took three more saliva samples again over that next week. And the prediction was that the treated group would have a lower cotinine level than the placebo control group. Yeah, what did you tell so we told them exactly what it was, that this is worm medication. Well, there's two, that there's, one of them was a calcium pill, that was the placebo. And we said, um, we don't know which one you're getting. You're going to get calcium or a benzol. We don't know which one. Um, and then at the end of the study, we gave everybody, we, gave, we had them paired. So your first pill, if your first pill was placebo, your second was a benzol. If your first pill was a benzol, your second was placebo. And we said, what you're going to do is, today you'll get pill number one, which might be calcium or a benzol, and then... At the end of the study, you'll get pill number two, so you will get treated either today or a week from now, and do or so, full or two weeks from now. Yeah, we've asked about that, and then no, they don't. So there, there's no sense that smoking. They do use uh, nicotine for treating a skin rash, um, but they didn't have any uh, ethnograph or you know cultural concept of using it for treating helmets. And just since you brought that up, uh, we asked them, is there anything that you um, smoke, anything that you use for treating helmets? And they said, oh yeah, we use this stuff called Matunga. Um, and it turns out they smoke it. So the one indigenous plant they smoke is the indigenous plant that they also use to treat worms. They don't use it by smoking it, they use it in a tea. Um, and it turns out that this is pretty widely known in this region, and so people have actually done a lot of um, biochemistry on Matunga, and indeed it does have anti-filarial and other anti-worm active compounds in it. I don't know if it has nicotine, because I've smoked it, and it gives you the same buzz as a cigarette, so it's got something psychoactive in it, and that um, is something I have a student working on right now, is to try and figure out what that psychoactive. Now, one of the anti-filarial compounds is something that does interact with serotonin receptors, so that might be the, the psychoactive part, but we don't know. And it turns out NIH is funding a program where you can screen any compound you want against an entire bank of uh, neuroreceptors. So once we get some of these compounds isolated, we'll hopefully convince those guys to screen it and find out which ones are potentially the psychoactive part. Okay. So here's our manipulation check for this study. Um, so here's sample one, two, three, four, five, six. This is time going this way. Um, after, sample, after they give sample three, that's when we randomize them into the two groups and they get the first pill in the packet. And this is worm burden score. And what we're seeing here is the placebo control group worm burden score versus the abendazole, excuse me, placebo control group versus abendazole treatment group. And you can see that, in fact, it worked. Um, so this is real gut check, nail biting when I ran this one. Like, this thing better work, and it did work. And it's a hugely significant difference between the two groups. And that was all again. Double blind. 
And here's our results. <coughs> so in this chart, this is again the entire sample. Uh, the black line is the placebo control group. The red line is the abendazole treatment group. Over time, these are the cotinine scores. These are standardized cotinine scores. And what you can see is a little bit of divergence. Uh, that is not significant, although it's in the right direction. So then, knowing that we have this thing where nothing seems to work at the low cotinine levels, but it starts to work once you <coughs> cut off those low cotinine guys and start, and so the cutoff again is 80, like we've done all the way through here. And um, you get the picture on the right, where you obviously see there's a much bigger difference between the placebo control group and the abendazole treatment group, and that difference is significant. So here are the linear models. This is just a simple t-test of the, comparing those two groups. Um, this is the percentage change in cotinine. What you can see is the control group goes up 100% from pre to post. The treatment group only goes up 25% pre to post. And there's a rough similar effect size, a bigger effect size here. If we restrict ourselves to smokers, that change is significant. If we do it across the entire sample, it's not. And you might be wondering, why is the control group going up? We don't know why, but we anticipated that because we're measuring these guys over time. All kinds of stuff could be going on in this population that changes smoking behavior from day to day and week to week. And we knew we couldn't necessarily understand why that's happening. So what we were basically predicting is whatever factors are going to be affecting the control group are going to be the same factors affecting the treatment group. This is all double-blind randomized. And so what we basically see here is after treatment, Smoking is going up for some reason in the population, but being suppressed in the treatment. Does that make sense? Were you paying them for participation? You're on, you're on to our hypothesis. So what we did here is we gave them a bowl. We were, we, to get these guys in the, in the study, we knew we'd have to pay them. So right, we said if we do the first three, you'll get a little bowl. It's worth about a dollar. And then if you finish the study, at the end, we'll give you money, another dollar, essentially. And we didn't want to give them money here, because we knew they'd go out and buy cigarettes. Uh, but what I think they were doing here is they weren't, they were taking that bowl and trading it, <laughs> or selling it, and then buying cigarettes. But both groups had the opportunity to do that. Neither one knew they were treating. So I don't think that screws up the study at all, even though we tried hard to avoid that effect. I think we did not. Uh, yeah? So did you count, did you have, have them report how many cigarettes they were smoking throughout this time? The ACA are extraordinarily bad at self-quantifying our own behavior. So we tried that in the first study in 2008, and we just got absurd numbers that were completely unbelievable. And that's true across any kind of study you want to do with them. They just, they're not used to this kind of, you know, we're very used to quantifying our behavior and how do we feel and all this, so they're not used to that at all. So we say, how many cigarettes did you smoke today? Well, I smoke a pack if I have it. Of course, they never have a pack. So. Uh, we just can't, I don't think it's feasible for us to have them self-report number of cigarettes. Instead, what we have them self-report is, did you smoke today? And also, they, they share. So as soon as they get a cigarette, they break it in half or thirds and pass it around. So you, so you do have a debt. Well, what, what we have from the first study is our attempt to do it, but the data, I think, are completely unreliable. What we have in the second study is, did you smoke today, yes or no? And did you smoke yesterday, yes or no? Which I do think is reliable. So you're wondering, can we tell what's going on here? Yeah, so I don't see a uh, access here for the number of cigarettes. We can't, we didn't ask number of cigarettes. Well, did they smoke today? Yeah, I do have those data and I haven't run them yet. I do have a yes or no for did you smoke cigarettes or not? Today, did you smoke yesterday? But that is only, that question is only asked here. So all of our interview questions are only asked when, we, when they enter the study. And we then, here what we do is we just get our stool and cotinine kit back, give them another kit, <laughs> say bring, you know, bring that back in a couple of days. Want, you know, you, I mean, that's what you want to do. You want to verify that. You'd expect people to actually just, just do, some, do less smoking, actually. Right. And it's right. this, well, this treatment group here. Right, well what we have is lower cotinine over three days. Yeah, but you, you want to demonstrate actually that they were smoking. Well, this is our index of that. So every, every measure has its problems, unless you, every measure has a, so this is our index of smoking behavior. Remember, we've got. Because other things could be causing lower coating. Like what? I don't know. 
Okay. Yes, you're right. You're right. Other things could. So this, as with all these studies, it's it's an index of smoking, but it is not smoking. But I think to really do it. What you want, it would be an extraordinarily difficult behavioral study where you'd have to have observers tracking people and watching what they're doing, which I'm not sure. Well, I mean, I mean, in the perfect world, you could imagine, you could ask, you could ask, I mean, you're there the whole time, presumably, during the study. Yeah. You could ask them every day, or every couple, two days. You can't even ask them how many cigarettes have you smoked today. That, even that doesn't work. Like, how many, like, to put a number on things, I don't know why, it just doesn't work. I don't know why. Can you show the main prediction that you should see a difference between your groups? That's what we see. We see. And isn't that the, the main thing that you're predicting? You're not trying to predict, you're trying to predict the effect of the treatment on dopamine levels, right? Treatment versus control. Right. And that so difference is what we're predicting. And so if, this, if both of these went way up, as long as there's a difference, it's fine. If they both went way down, that's what I'm saying. That's as what long I'm as there's saying. a difference, it's fine. I think it doesn't matter how the lines shift as long as there's this difference and as long as that difference is significant in this direction. I agree. That's what I think. And we, we knew that this was a possibility because smoking behavior can change across, you know, this is two, three, four weeks. It can change for all kinds of reasons. It might not be what that they were selling their pots, but it might be uh, that a certain crop had come in and the villagers were now hiring them to do a lot of work starting here and now they're getting more money or maybe the tobacco plants had finally you know uh were available and there's all kind of, or maybe a new package of cigarettes that showed up so there's all kinds of reasons why across the population it should be fluctuating that's why we do the placebo control group it's the difference between the placebo control group and the treatment group that's essential here i think so yeah yeah and we're confident that albendazole pharmacologically it doesn't change no that's we're not confident of that so that could be, we need to have a negative control. So we need to have a population that we know is not infected with worms and give them a bend and that are smokers and give them a bendazole and see if a bendazole has an effect on smoking independent of its effect on worms. We don't know that. And so negative control is going to be part of the NIH proposal to pay for that. And we'll probably do it, that's something we could do like on campus because we can probably assume that most kids are not infected with worms and just get a bunch of Smokers and give them a bendazole. I'll see if I can get that through a IRB. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see if it changes their smoking. Yeah, you're absolutely right. One more thing, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. But it, you can imagine you could have gotten, perhaps, this passed by an IRB. It's actually a smoker control, a smoker group now. And a, which means you can call it a treatment group, a smoking treatment group, where you provide the cigarettes for them. I don't think that would ever get by an IRB. Getting this through IRB, <laughs> here I'm like, I'm going to go and treat these guys for worms. Uh, we have the you know Attorney General of the WSU because we're now doing a clinical control trial by legal definition, and you're giving a drug, and so this whole legal bureaucratic apparatus came into play just to do this. Uh, maybe that's just a feature of WSU, but it was it was extraordinary. And they're going to get passed around and still you give students booze and all kinds of things. You, you might be able to give smokers. I don't know. It, but this is also a vulnerable population. I don't know. We could consider that, but I don't know how comfortable I can feel with that myself. So we could give them money and, you know. Let them do what they will. Yeah, and, I mean, you know whether they're. I mean. You I can send them the cigarettes down and watch who shows up. Maybe. Uh, it is a very, yeah, I mean, it's, here's, just to remind you, we have these, sorry, <laughs> this one, sorry, yeah, so this is, and there is quite a bit of variation here, but on average, there's a pretty good, strong linear relationship between coating levels and number of cigarettes smoked in the last 24 hours. Does your new sample have enough smoking women to do anything with? Um, we have 100 women, and I don't know how many of them, but it's, it's still very rare for women to smoke. It's mostly the older women that are postmenopausal that are smoking. Um, but what, did you, what were you thinking? Well, so there's two things. One is you've got this big gender difference. It doesn't have any transparent biological reason behind it. Um, and, and by the way, we see that cross-culturally. That big gender difference. 
So it's not just in this population that we see it. That's a pretty common pattern locally. Access to money. Hmm? I think it's pregnancy. I, I, I mean, if you ask the ACA, we asked them, we did quite a bit of ethnographic research on that sex difference, and that's a big part of one of my students' dissertations, is that sex difference. And what the ACA themselves will tell you is that smoking is bad for the baby. And that's why women don't smoke. The only time women in Ben Clue smoke is when they're pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and say the baby wants to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Andy. I'm just telling you what the ACA said. The ACA or what? Right. <laughs> It might, it might be, it might be from the mission. I've said that to Marty a lot. I'd like to put that message out there. It might be, there is a health clinic in there, in the village, and the churches might be saying that too. Yeah, we don't know this. women have more access to the market economy than younger women? It's debatable. It's very egalitarian society. It's possibly, but I don't know if that's really true. Yeah. Is, is there a sex difference in warm burden? Um, good question. We did look at that. Uh, basically, men are more vulnerable to parasites, and that's what we see in this population with the warm burden. Men have higher score. That's what we saw in that 2008 study. Haven't run on this, these numbers yet, but we did see that in the 2008 study. Uh, you might notice that's not quite significant. So I did a little bit of a manipulation to get it. <laughs> So the, 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 my thinking was that if you're <laughs> worm burden, if you have no worms, uh, if your smoking level changes, it can't be related to changes in worms if you had no worms to begin with in that one, two, three. So what I decided to do is weight your delta cotony by your worm score in one, two, three. And what we get is now it's significant, but actually the means don't really the relative difference in the means don't really change much. So this, I'm not sure how important this is or good that is, but at least it gets us technically below 0.05 instead of slightly above 0.05. Yeah. Any questions about that? No. Yeah. Um, Just a quick question. Okay, so just to, to conclude, um, we think that the, the uh, evolutionary biological account of drug origins doesn't square very easily with the reward model of drug use, we call that the paradox. Um, one hypothesis that we have to resolve that paradox is that humans might have evolved to counter-exploit neuro uh, or psychoactive plant toxins to kill pathogens. So these neurotoxins are bad for us, but they're worse for our pathogens. <clears throat> In support, self-reported smokers have significantly lower helmet flow than non-smokers, but only women. That's that first pilot study. Among smokers, cotinine levels are negatively correlated with helmet flow. That's replicated now in the second study. And among smokers, treatment with abendazole reduced smoking relative to placebo. Of course, we still have many limitations. All of the stuff about correlation doesn't equal causation applies to our observational study still. Uh, we have more controls now, but maybe we don't have the right controls. We have that unexplained positive relationship at low cotinine levels that doesn't, we didn't predict. Um, and there's you know, obviously alternative hypotheses. Now for the experimental study, um, the limitation is that effect is significant only for the regular smokers. It's, it's again, not significant if we include the, the entire range. And we don't know what the causal mechanism is. As Dan brought up, it could be that abendazole has a direct effect on smoking behavior independent of its effect on worms. Or there could be some other, there's all kinds of causal mechanisms that might explain this other than the one that we propose. So we, we still have a lot of work to do. One of the main things I want to do is we now have a bunch of treated ACA, and we know their smoking behavior. So I want to go back now a year later and see and get more smoking behavior and new worm data and see if the heavier smokers have lower reinfection rates than the um, uh, non-smokers or, or lower intensity smokers. And that won't be a purely experimental study. I'm not sure if it even qualifies as a quasi-experimental, but at least it gives us a, an observational way of seeing if smoking is protecting you from reinfection. Um, so that's step two. That's it.